Welcome back my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today I am super excited to present an interview I did with Dr. Robert Kiltz who is a reproductive endocrinologist. He has been in this profession as a medical doctor for over 25 years and he uses a ketogenic diet and sometimes a carnivore diet with his patients who are struggling with infertility. Now, even if you're not struggling with infertility, I think this is a very, very relevant conversation because we talk a lot about inflammation. And he basically says that a lot of infertility is inflammation. So if you are struggling with a lot of inflammation, I think you'll find quite a bit of value in this conversation. And I thank you guys very much for watching. The sponsor of today is Upgraded Formulas. In a recent Instagram post I just did last week, I believe, I showed you guys a picture of myself before and after electrolytes. Now, if you are doing a low carb carnivore or ketogenic diet, you are putting your, or fasting, you're putting your body in a low insulin state. In a low insulin state, we are more likely to lose minerals like sodium, potassium, magnesium, and sometimes calcium. And I had a really difficult time balancing those electrolytes, figuring out how much of what I needed. When I tried to use electrolyte packets, I would throw myself a little bit more out of balance. So if I just bought like a regular electrolyte packet, I would really throw myself out of balance. So using upgraded formulas, hair tissue mineral analysis, it actually shows you what your levels are and it goes over the last 90 days. It comes from your hair. So it's actually the tissues in your body and getting a consultation with that hair tissue mineral analysis is what has helped me ultimately to get my electrolytes back in balance. I no longer have the face swelling, heart palpitations, muscle cramps, fatigue, all those things that come along with electrolyte imbalance. So if you are in that situation, if you're following low carb carnivore keto, or you're doing a lot of fasting, which Dr. Kiltz and I do talk about in this episode, and you're struggling, then I highly recommend getting that hair tissue mineral analysis from Upgraded Formulas. You can use my code YOGI for 10% off. It will not work on subscriptions, but this is a really wonderful way to just find out where you are with those levels. All right, guys, let's get into that interview. Make sure you check out Upgraded Formulas, and I will talk with you again soon. Bye. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning in to this episode. I'm really excited about today's guest. I've got Dr. Kiltz. I think he's in New York today. I know he is a, a national doctor, works all over the United States, but I'm very excited to talk with him today. Thank you, Dr. Kiltz, for being here. Sarah, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yes. Um, we are going to talk all things fertility, reproductive health, and just health in general. I mean, I know you... You're very passionate about sharing your story, right? And just how these, you know, this is the way that you eat and the way that you live your life has changed your life, right? Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm just sharing the journey because we're all humans. We're almost identical in so many ways. And so when we learn something that is amazing, personally, as a physician, I just want to share it with everyone. Yes, absolutely. And so you've been doing this type of a lifestyle for a while then, right? 10 years plus. And uh, before that, I was kind of atkins -y, but didn't really understand why I was doing it, what I was doing. I kind of maybe was a little bit in the fasting mode, but not that not, I didn't understand it either. Uh, but when I began to see my patients conceiving and delivering babies on various different dietary regimens, uh, I was like, wow, there must be something here. Let me understand the science behind it. And let me start talking about it and sharing it. Wonderful. Wonderful. So you do mostly a carnivore diet, right? And you advocate that for your patients and you're a fertility doctor, correct? Yes. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, uh, infertility specialist. I do a lot of reproductive immunology. I'm a surgeon. Uh, my job is to help those that are suffering uh, from infertility and help them uh, become and find their success in one way or another. Wonderful. Wonderful. And when did you start kind of implementing, let's say like a carnivore or keto style diet with a lot of your patients? Well, uh, let's see. I started seeing my fertility nearly 25 years ago. Uh, about 20 years ago, I implemented yoga, acupuncture, meditation, prayer. Uh, then about 15 years ago, I started to begin into this, but really solidly 10 years ago, 
I began to really share the idea of carnivore and intermittent um, uh, and fasting. I call it intermittent feasting, fasting uh, and ketogenic lifestyle because you can do it whether you're a carnivore or not in some ways to reduce inflammation. But to me, the really top of the, of the, of the line is, is going to be carnivore. Yeah. You'll work with people who do vegetarian and vegan though, right? That's absolutely. I work with say. everyone because we want to work with them and their belief systems and their, and their lifestyles and help them understand that, that keto is not just carnivore, but keto is, is a, is a low glucose environment. Um, it's real. it shows up the ketone bodies essentially, but it's a, a higher fat and it can be accomplished simply by eating one time a day or less and cooking the carbs well and adding fat. So when you learn some of the scientific facts of this journey, you can really begin to whittle your way into a healthier mindset and, and, and physicality. I love it. I love it. And you know, what do you, so many people out there say, and this is what I said before we turn on the camera that if you do a diet like carnivore, like keto, or even fasting, that it's an absolute disaster for your fertility. Um, how do you kind of counteract that? I'm sure people kind of come to you and say that every now and then. Well, the, the modern recommendations of food are all based on industrial marketing to sell a lot more food. And most of that food is plant-based, which technically is all sugar. And mm. sugar is the leading killer of all of us. And so uh, when I began to look at the, the, the evidence, by eating less frequently, you lower the inflammation. Fat is always the energy of our mitochondria. It's never sugar. Um, and when you understand that, um, you begin to understand that um, fat is always there. So you don't, your sugar is always converted to fat. And if you look at the animal world, many, many organisms uh, and mammals, un unless you're a grazing animal, do not eat all the time. Mm -hmm. And many of them get pregnant and don't eat throughout their pregnancy. So they gain weight, get pregnant, and then they live off their fat stores throughout their pregnancy and do not uh, drink, eat um, at all throughout their pregnancy which is quite remarkable. And my bet is historically for, I don't know how many thousands of years, we had access to food very limited. We had to find our food. And so since we weren't growing food, we had to mostly hunt and the hunt was not easy. No animal wants to easily be killed, but that was the, that was the best fuel for us as human animals. And that's what we wanted. And so the fact that we can go weeks without food, uh, days without water, uh, I began to live that more uh, 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 in my present day living and sharing it. Now, going it more than one day without food is not easy. So no. I always say just one meal at night is the very best thing you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing you just talked about was mitochondria. Now, that's a hot topic. Uh, and Oh, I think what a lot of people don't know is women is that are the biggest source of mitochondria is in the ovaries, right? Well, the, the mitochondria is necessary for production of ATP and the yes. energy and yeah. the ovary and the, the, the developing oocytes um, and reproduction requires lots of energy. Yeah. So it's one of the places where there's a lot of, lot of mitochondria for sure. Yeah. So you think fasting is probably the best thing a woman can do that maybe doesn't have good egg quality or maybe is having issues with um, ovulation. You think that's a helpful thing to do? Absolutely, because when you fast, I call it intermittent feasting, which mm -hmm. means you feast from time to time and you have long periods of fasting. To me, it's 23 hours and you get one meal at night. So then you rest and digest because you, when you rest, your blood flow goes to your reproductive productive organs and your gastrointestinal organs. And now you allow the digestion to take place, which again, it gets the glucose that's in the bloodstream converted to fat in the liver and the rest of your body to be stored so that you can hum along the rest of the day, keeping your glucose levels lower, essentially reducing inflammation from glycation, which is a really fascinating story that we don't really talk about very much. 
Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit, because I feel like there's a big epidemic right now of infertility. Um, I hear about it constantly of women just and it's not even just women, you know, that are 40 and over trying to start having babies. It's women in their 30s. I know several women and unfortunately, as a yoga teacher, several yoga teachers that, you know, are doing vegan, vegetarian type of diets and thinking it's the healthiest thing in the world and struggling with fertility for many years. So let's, can we talk about the glucose and fertility thing? Well, all diseases are on the rise at younger and younger ages. I see women in their teens and twenties with diminished ovarian reserve all day long, polycystic ovarian syndrome or metabolic disorders or pre-diabetes is so common now, it's because we're pushed to eat three to six meals a day. And the majority of that is plant-based. And what people don't understand is that plants are live organisms that do not want to die. They want to reproduce. Well, they convinced us how to help them reproduce, but we're eating too much of them too frequently. And since all seeds and nuts and leaves and fruits and fiber and vegetables essentially break down to mostly glucose in the gastrointestinal tract. The glucose is then taken up into the liver where it's converted to fatty acids via insulin. And so as long as your gastrointestinal tract, the bucket is full of digesting carbohydrates, you're always going to be secreting glucose into your bloodstream. Essentially, your glucose levels are going to be me, uh, higher, medium level, median level. And so that's the long-term excess glucose, which causes damage to every nook and cranny of your body. The glycobiome is damaged, which allows microorganisms and other uh, antigenic particles of plants, lectins, oxalates, phytates, and more which are microscopic, they embed in every organ system of our bodies. That's why people get migraines, arthritis, mm -hmm. psoriasis, seizures, bowel disorders, bleeding. I mean, I'll go down the list. Yeah, It's all due to that. And so glycation damages the mitochondria. The mitochondria can't make ATP. Plus the, the, the first uh, uh, organ system to be damaged is the capillary and the vessels, which causes damage to those vessels. Hypertension is one sign of it. But when you damage the vessels feeding the ovary or the uterus or the tubes or the testicles, you've actually diminished the oxygen carrying capacity to those organ systems. It's really oxygen is depleted and the cells die and mm -hmm. thus your, your oocytes die, your pool of oocytes die. And so your, your AMH goes down under one and even 0 0.01 I'm seeing so commonly really? in women in their twenties. Wow. <clears throat> That's in insane. It, it's an insane story that most people hear and go like, ah, oh, no way. Come on. All yeah. my vegan friends are so healthy. But again, this is nothing about being a vegan or vegetarian. It's eating too frequently and eating too much variety. Yeah. Variety and spice are deadly in my opinion. And what people don't know is plants make the chemicals that cause your reproductive system to be diminished. They make the chemicals and the products that essentially damage us and kill us because plants want to live, survive, and reproduce. But if we eat them, they can't do that. Mm. So they have millions of years more evolution than we do. And um, they have more DNA evolution than us. And, and plus, we have been convinced by the plants to make them hardier and survive better yeah. and make them more sweeter and have more sugar. It's just, a, it's just a spiraling down. And we just can't quite figure it out. But the story is simple. We are more like lions than we are like cows and pigs. If you look at our gastrointestinal system, it is more like a wolf or a lion. And wolves and lions, dogs and cats that have been domesticated are fed a high plant-based diet. Mm. And dogs and cats get all the diseases humans get. Now, dogs and cats are obligate carnivores in their ancient pre-domesticated uh, world. My bet is humans were mostly that 
But this is where that fasting for longer comes in and being very discerning about what you're eating. Again, if you look at, even just look at Wikipedia, plant poisons, you'll see the list of the very common foods we eat that contain toxins that are damaging our organ systems. And when we talk about cancer and diabetes and hypertension, heart disease and infertility, my bet is the cause is a plant-based diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's crazy. The messaging right now is just so focused on the plants and that meat is evil and it's bad and it's going to hurt you. And so how, how do you, I guess, counsel your patients and help them with this brainwashing that they've all kind of experienced and been through and help them to change their diets? Well, we're all brainwashed between our politics, our religions, our cultures, and our lifestyles. Remember, well, it's I'm Italian and you know I'm Irish or or uh, I'm from Ethiopia or wherever we're at, we have our cultures of what we eat. And so these are our these are our belief systems that have been ingrained to us over thousands of years. So I I'm not here to try to change what you believe in. I'm just here to give you a different story. Most people, they're coming to me because they have a problem. And one of the things that we in medicine don't really talk about is how your diet, food, lifestyle may be affecting your health and wellness. Because most people tell me, I ask them what they eat and they say, well, I eat healthy. I'm saying, okay, that wasn't the question. What do you eat? (laughs) Give me the list, write it down, take pictures of what you eat. Now let's look carefully and try to find the, the, the chemicals or the antigens that might be causing your problem. As you're bringing your ideas uh, of carnivore and, and, and yoga, uh, the more we share these stories, the more people begin like, oh my God, personally, my arthritis, psoriasis, kidney stones, migraines, and bowel bleeding went away in just a matter of a month. And I'm like, whoa, now I've got something to talk about because I suffered. I'm 65. I didn't learn this until I was 55. But when I see the number of people that suddenly conceive and deliver a baby on this story, it's radically amazing. We need to share the story. You can continue with whatever belief you want, but remember our beliefs are just marketed to us over thousands of years and more frequently over just a a lifetime of of our own uh, uh, listening and learning and watching. But the majority of these companies are industrial mega uh, um, uh, companies that have a lot of monetary value Mm -hmm. and want to sell an idea that they believe in cognizant dissonance. You believe one thing, but something else is really true. How can lettuce and asparagus be bad for you? How can they be sugar? Well, if you understand biology and science that carbon dioxide in the air and water and sunlight come together to make a long chain carbon particle, which only breaks down to sugar in your GI tract. And that's the simple story. Right. And if we have those elevated blood sugars, I mean, that's inflammation in the body. That's the biggest thing. Correct. But the norms that we use in modern medicine, I think are incorrect because where we do a, we do a fasting blood sugar. Okay. You had your three meals yesterday and you're going to fast overnight. You're going to come to the doctor's office and get your blood drawn. And we're going to say, okay, your blood level looks good. It's 80. All right. But my bet is 80 is not good. It should be probably a little more like 40 to 60. Now I'm giving some ideas that are radical and different. I don't know what my blood level would be if I went three days without eating, but as long as there's food in my gastrointestinal tract, I'm digesting and sending glucose into the bloodstream until my GI tract is empty of all food. Then I can really be fasting and check to see what my level would be. Mm. But again, my bet is our norms are too high. And over years of those slightly elevated norms, that's where the damage comes of all of our diseases in the 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond. But again, we're seeing it in the, in the preteens and teens, I think we're also seeing it in infancy because pregnant women are encouraged to eat three meals, lots of fruits and vegetables, which ultimately elevates their glucose levels. The glucose goes through the placenta to the baby. 
And babies gain a lot of weight because of that, because the glucose simply converted to fat, which is mm. it must be converted to fat or else you die. So again, when you begin to listen to the story enough, but you got to really back up and you got to be like, okay, I don't believe this, but I'm going to listen and learn something opposite that I know so that maybe I'll take better control of my health and wellness and learn something that I control, yeah. not someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're saying that you think it's okay for women to do fasting and ketosis essentially during pregnancy. Absolutely. Now, if you're anorexically thin, obviously you're not healthy and it's not good. Right. Of fat being overweight as we have labeled in modern medicine is bad. Um, we have no idea what our weight really should be because the problem of obesity isn't being overweight. It's the food in your gastrointestinal tract that actually causes the disease. Mm. So, so uh, my bet is that we're actually meant to get fat. Uh, and again, this is the definition is all over the place right now, but you're meant to gain some weight, carry some, some fat on your, your hips and, and your arms and your belly. Now there's excess and there's the right amount. Uh, and then once you're pregnant, uh, many women have nausea and vomiting in early yeah. pregnancy, which says, do not put that food in my body because it's toxic. Your body is trying to protect your baby. And so water and sips and getting through that. But I say, stay as carnivore keto as you can, or as, as kilts as keto lifestyle, I call it, which is that one meal a day, high fat and low to no carbs. But if you are a vegan or vegetarian, cook the carbs well, um, add the fat. Now I should say, so fat is added to a vegetarian, which is butter or cream for vegans. You're adding oil. Remember fat and oil are different. Fat comes mm -hmm. from an animal. Oil comes from a plant. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really important. But if you're using hemp seed oil or olive oil or coconut oil, now remember we're highly allergic to seeds and nut oils and yeah. seeds, and nuts. And my, my opinion is the allergies are actually the diseases we carry. So we think of an allergy as redness and swelling and pain, but an allergy might be cancer. It might be heart disease. It might be infertility. So I'm infertile. Well, that's an allergic reaction likely to something that gets in your body. Mm. And I believe there are no such thing as autoimmune diseases. Your body's not attacking itself. Your body is attacking some foreign particle that's gotten in your body via breathing, eating, drinking, or it somehow gets through our body, through our pores and, and, and our skin. So the immunologic conditions we have when you actually step back and say, okay, it's likely something I'm eating, but the testing for food allergies is highly inaccurate. Mm. And so- you do an elimination diet. Okay. Now to me, it's fat and a minimal amount of protein. And so you can technically eat fat as the fuel and, and eat a minimal amount of protein because you don't need very much protein. And that's why, that's why as a vegetarian with butter, cream, and eggs, it's easier yeah. to do that. And the vegans are really the hardest one. Now, remember as a vegan, you must supplement your diet. Well, so that's a modern diet that requires human industrial complexes to create a supplement. So you're getting all your nutrients, mm -hmm. but there's never okay. been a, a, a human uh, uh, culture that has thrived and survived for thousands of years as a vegan, because we are not grazing animals. We're not on four legs and we're not grazing in, um, in, the, in the savannah. We're meant to hunt and eat meat as our primary source of health and wellness, I believe. Mm, I agree. Yeah, it would be very hard, I think, to work with a vegan, but you, you won't turn anyone away, right? I work with everyone and, and I highly admire those that have their belief systems and I just want to give them some ideas. And, and so coconut oil, hemp seed oil, making sure you're getting your B uh, complex and, you know, D, vitamin D is a fat soluble mm. vitamin, A, D, E, K. Those are like the key. And so there are some supplements you can do to get that. But remember, 
you're you're creating an unhealthy environment, I believe. And and the plants, they have made all the chemicals to kill bacteria, yeast, viruses, and other microbes. And if you if you understand modern agriculture, uh, we have done a lot of of manipulation of of plants and bacteria and other things to try to to try to help the plant make whatever substance is needed to kill those little microbes, those little insects, so they don't decimate the 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 uh, the crop. Mm. And and the the human um, the world today requires a high plant based diet because you can't feed the millions and millions of people on a animal based diet. And I think that that's the kind of um, pushing of that diet in order to continue to grow the, the, the Kings and Queens and, and all the dictators of the world. And now they become the, the largest uh, corporations of the world, which are selling to make more money and forgetting about the people who are consuming these things that might be damaged from them. Yeah, absolutely. That's, we have to learn and do our own research. And that's what was so crazy to me as you know, yoga teacher, I've been doing yoga for many years and teaching for about 12 years. And I did vegan for when I first started teaching, because I thought it was the right thing to do. It was what I had to do morally. It was good. And then my health just got to be a complete mess. I was getting injured all the time. I would try to do this kind of athletic type of yoga and I'd get injured and then my injuries would just never heal. Like I, I was like, I would go get body work done and acupuncture and try to do everything and rest. And the injuries just never would heal. And uh, finally, my, one of my teachers, one of my yoga teachers said, you've got to start eating animal protein because you're not going to be able to be of service to anyone anymore. And that's why you're doing this, right? <laughs> it, absolutely. And the interesting part, remember, it's, see, everyone thinks we need a lot of protein. Yeah. We actually need fat. We mm. need to eat animal fat because animal fat is soap. You know, they make soap out of fat. Yes, they made I, it so that's all I use. Of, I don't use regular soap anymore. I don't use lotion or soap. I just use tallow. And, and, and so uh, we don't eat it. So that means our bowels are not cleansed. You know, just see, if you think about the tube of our intestines and we're shoving plant material and fiber and, and all the bacteria, yeast and microorganisms that come with the plant material, mm -hmm. which is, I call it sandpaper or steel wool going through the GI tract. It damages something called the glycobiome. And I don't know if you could see this. This mm -hmm. is really interesting concepts and ideas. Most people know nothing about the glycobiome. Mm -mm. The glycobiome trumps the microbiome. When the glycobiome is damaged, the microbiome actually takes over and has more uh, uh, damaging uh, uh, microbes in there. Uh, when the micro, when the glycobiome, which is the mucus Teflon shield of every epithelial um, cell linings of our body, and it's the connective tissue between cells, when that's damaged, it's all over. And so that is the most amazing thing is that the microbes, you know, everyone's pushing probiotics. I don't believe we should be pushing probiotics. We should be we should be pushing a healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is completely different. That personally, I take no supplements. I don't. I don't. I have minimal exercise. I do light weights. I do a little bit of walking. Occasionally, ride my bike. I do a lot of meditation, a little yoga, tai chi. Um, I've gotten off the treadmill because I too, like you, had many um, uh, damaging to joints and muscles and other areas back aches and everything. And um, to me, the gastrointestinal tract, I call it the, the, the bucket between the diaphragm and the rectum. Basically this bucket is full of digesting, fermenting uh, food and fermentation of all plant material makes heat, alcohol, aldehydes, and methane gas. Mm. And that affects the pancreas, the liver, the kidneys, the ovaries, the tubes, the uterus, the back. I believe most back disease, our lower back pain and bulging discs is all caused by gastrointestinal inflammation. Mm. And even endometriosis is simply a gastrointestinal inflammatory disorder due to a high plant-based, low-fat diet. It's remarkable. And it's the most amazing story I've ever learned. Wow. I mean, so many people are saying now that we need plants 
to have a healthy gut. And there, there have been some studies out. I know there was one recently that said fermented foods like yogurt or sauerkraut would actually be better for the microbiome than all the fiber. But that's a message that is out there quite a bit of people who are opposing the carnivore diet. They say, you're going to ruin your microbiome. It's going to be incredibly unhealthy if you don't have the variety from the plants in there. Well, last I've never looked to see what variety is in the plants, but my bet is, so plants contain viruses, bacteria, yeast, and other microorganisms. They live out there. You can never wash them off. You might be able to kill them by cooking them well, which may disable or soaking them, which may disable many of those things. Uh, but even fermented foods, can, again, you contain uh, vinegar and, and, and maybe yeah. a little bit of alcohol, but you're still getting some of the sugar and the carbohydrates. I would say that fermented food maybe is a little bit better uh, because they've broken down those bonds. See, fiber uh, is able to get down to the colon. Uh, fiber is not good for us, by the way. It doesn't cleanse or cleanse the bowels. It doesn't help your bowels move, um, but it damages them. It's And it allows fermentation in the colon um, that elevates, again, the heat, gas, alcohol, aldehydes, and methane, which causes the damage. Uh, cancer is is on the rise in younger people, colon cancer. Mm -hmm. it is. Uh, one of my good friends just has a diagnosed with anal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's silent. The, see, the things are, I feel great. And then I've got cancer. And like what happened, I was in a healthy lifestyle, but we be, believe we're in a high, healthy lifestyle, which can take you so far, by the way, because belief and meditation and prayer are very powerful concepts and ideas that I think we need to be sharing more and more. Uh, but, you know, I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. I'm only here to give you an idea that you might go, huh, I'm not feeling well. I've got these problems. Maybe I should look at this. There's a lot of uh, bias uh, 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 science. And just because it's published doesn't mean it's true because mm -hmm. publications also have a mission of their belief systems. And if you're outside uh, the, the corral of that one, you're not going to be let in. And so money, you know, the, if the Flexner report and how they eliminated many medical schools for women and for minorities as, and, and many other things, it's, it's control. Uh, mm -hmm. The control is via the money, the pharmaceuticals, the stock market, the industrial complexes. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not to say, I don't think we really understand these concepts because no one's listening because yeah. killing a cow <clears throat> is bad, but killing lettuce or kale is okay. And right. the idea that plants aren't live sentient organisms is, is a fallacy. They too have electromolecular energy. They uh, communicate. There's a vibrational energy in all, all entities of the universe. And so in order to be alive, you must eat something. Uh, you can't just drink water and, and breathe air. You have to eat food and you may be able to live long enough and you may be okay on a vegan or vegetarian diet, uh, but it's, it's not those in particular. It's all of our dieting, which is the problem. If you simply went to one meal a day, at night and cooked it well and added fat, boy, that's like a home run in and of itself. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very radical um, because when you look at like a fertility diet, if you kind of Google that people are really recommending Mediterranean diet, like you said, eating three to six times per day. And they say to do that, to keep the blood sugar stable, you know, several snacks throughout the day and eating kind of Mediterranean style and uh, that's what's out there if you want to look and see what a good fertility diet is. <laughs> well, well and, and I'm Italian, and I lived that Mediterranean diet for many years, and I suffered. When I was a little mm. kid, I suffered. I had migraines and bowel problems, and I went to the doctor. It's like, here's some aspirin and, and uh, that Metamucil and, and, and um, Pepto-Bismol. I lived on those things. I lived on anti, uh, 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 antihistamines for years. Claritin, Benadryl for years, nasal spray for years. And then I went to the carnivore, I call it Kiltz's carnivore or Kiltz's lifestyle, which is the one meal a day and high fat. And I eliminated all the plants and I stopped eating all the drugs. Mm. I was like, wow. Okay. Now. Okay. Then if you look at Kevin stock, he's a dentist, yep. has some really great stuff. Um, you know, Judy Cho, we talked about Judy. 
Uh, Maria and Craig Emmerich has some good stuff, but ultimately this is not new stuff. It's thousands of years old. Yeah. And if you really look at our cultures and civilizations, uh, we, we didn't have access to all the market and all the food, um, you know, and you had to go out and, and hunt and gather. And that was a lot of work. Nowadays we sit around, we got our seeds and nuts. We got our almond milk. We're eating too often. And in most, in many cases, those are antigenic foods. They don't just go into our, our GI tract and go out the other end. And we, we save only the things that bring us energy we're bringing in the microscopic uh, uh, particles of lectins, oxalates. Look at Sally Norton has some really great stuff. Mm -hmm. Georgia Eads, she's a psychiatrist, <laughs> talks about carnivore. Uh, it, it's just a radical, radical concept. Ken Berry, so mm -hmm. many really great, great people that are sharing the story. But the more everyone shares the story, it's the very best. And I, I, we're storytellers. The humans, we love stories. That's why that social media and all this yeah. stuff is really coming up. And, and some people are going to say, nope, you're wrong. And we just have to be okay with everyone has the right to their own opinion. And we need to honor that on all sides. Uh, but when we find something that's pretty radical and amazing, wow. Now I do, by the way, love French fries, <laughs> fried in duck grease, dipped in mayonnaise. I put butter on my steak uh, and I make an ice cream. Uh, if you Google Kiltz's ice cream, it's uh, cream and egg, uh, uh, sugar cane, sugar and uh, vanilla bean, but you got to get it from the bean. Don't get all mm -hmm. the alcohol in the extract. And, and from time to time, sugar's okay. And it's interesting. Most people say that simple sugar is bad. Complex sugars are good, right? Yes. So if it's a vegetable yeah. or fruit, <clears throat> it's better for you. But in fact, the opposite is true. Because when you eat simple sugar from time to time, insulin is released, it causes the glucose in the liver to be converted to fatty acids, which are then stored in the liver and then sent around the body. But again, if you and lowers the glucose levels, which lowers gly glycation, if you eat a complex carb that takes hours and days to digest, you're mm. secreting glucose in your bloodstream all the time. And, and so you're always causing the glycation, which is the damaging component, which is the cause ultimately most disease. If it isn't an antigenic particle, which can cause an anaphylactic reaction rapidly, you have a difficulty breathing, um, you swell up and you can die or it's low and slow. It's happening deep in the bowels of our body. And we don't even know it until you're diagnosed with cancer or you suddenly drop dead uh, of an epileptic seizure or a, an arrhythmia that, that you're like, wow. Yeah. It's so many silent diseases out there. And then people, well, I was healthy and you're like, well, were you though? I mean, we're, the thing is like, we have this definition of I'm healthy and we're not looking at what's your A1C, what's your CRP, like there are all these other little markers. I'll, we'll look at stuff like cholesterol, which mine is, I just got mine back and it's a 250, you know. <laughs> Mine's sky high, yeah. but, but, but cholesterol, <clears throat> cholesterol is, it is, it is required for the human body. A low cholesterol is deadly and dangerous. So we've, the problem was, is that we, uh, our, we were getting, we were getting more diseases and we were getting obese. Um, so fat got the blame for the diseases. And so we went to a low fat diet and then more diseases came up and it got more uh, uh, prevalent. And, and so now it's like, okay, we got to really push this, this, your sugars down and your cholesterol down, but yep. we're going to give you oral drugs and, and, and intramuscular drugs and sub Q drugs and we're going to, your diet's going to be like the veganist of you can be. And, and we got worse. My sister Maria died at 52 of diabetes. Mm. She had since age four and oh my gosh. the diabetic diet is basically if you eat three to six plant-based meals a day, remember no white sugar, because we didn't consider complex carbs as sugar. This way right. you keep your sugar levels level. What the problem is level higher is what you got. And so mm. the damage happens and then we get you a new drug. And now the million dollar drugs are on the rise because in the majority of them are anti-inflammatory 
inflammatory. That's the mm-hmm. kind of the craziness, right? Okay, now we figured it out. It's inflammation. Let's treat inflammation. Yeah. You know, the most ancient one was aspirin taken from a willow tree, right? And let's take the bark and make a tea and we'll drink it and you'll feel better. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, so much in there that I wanted to unpack. Um, I guess my big question is I wanted to revisit the simple sugar thing real quick because that's the thing that there's like this thing going on in the keto community right now where it's like, it's good to have one day a week where you do a refeed and you have some complex carbohydrates. Maybe you do sweet potatoes or blueberries or some kind of fruit, but I actually have another friend that I'm going to, or doctor that I'm going to be interviewing in a couple weeks. And she's not really very well known in the community. She's kind of newer, but she's a, she's actually a gynecologist OBGYN and works with a lot of women. And her big thing is ketosis, sunshine, and then one day a week, a simple sugar, just a little refeed to kind of give your, get your body out of stress mode and then jump right back into ketosis. And once well, you ketosis, get- ketosis is not stress, right? It's, it's our, it's our natural state that we've lived through probably for millions of years. Cause if you only, but this idea of ketosis and keto is just a label. It's like paleo yeah. or Atkins, it l- eliminate it. You want to be in a human healthy lifestyle. Um, I eat sugar more than once a week. I, I love my ice cream. And I, again, if it's a small amount, uh, it's a treat. I, I reward myself. Mm. Um, I just stay away from the things that I know are deadly. Sweet potatoes, uh, potatoes, you know, a little bit from time to time, but if you have too much of them, they contain solanase. Mm. People don't even know what's in these, these, these potatoes. Right. And potatoes can be very toxic if they're not, if they're not um, uh, picked at the right time uh, or processed properly, cassava will kill you. Mm. So again, this idea of stress, keto is not stress. It's actually the best thing you could ever do, mm. but I never measure it. I, I don't get on the scale. Um, you know, I've, I've got, got a couple of extras, but a little extra is always good because if, if see being skinny is not good being carrying some fat is where it's at because if you get sick, you need the fat because that's actually the store. That's your energy. You never use glucose for energy. This is a hard one. Your brain doesn't use it. Your muscles don't use it. It's impossible because remember anorexics die fast. They get very sick. They go into a coma. If you give a bolus of insulin and drop a glucose, you'll go into a coma, but you won't die right away. So my bet is the glycobiome, glycosylation. Glycosylation is the normal binding of a glycan to a protein or a lipoprotein, which gives it the proper structure and function. This is like the most radical, like literally the neuro, the nervous system and, and the, the, the neurons are having to mass produce the neurochemicals rapidly at the speed of light, okay? Just us talking and me moving and all the things that are going on, this is not happening like, and like, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes for this to happen. And f- acetyl-CoA is a mm-hmm. two carbon structure. Simple short chain, medium chain fatty acids are everywhere in your cytoplasm and in your mitochondrial cisterns. Okay. So all you have to do is clip a two carbon particle off of that, but to take glucose to pyruvate to acetyl CoA is a lengthy process. It makes absolutely no scientific sense. If you really understand our biology and you get to understand, you sit it and go like, okay, now why would, why would mitochondria use glucose? In yes. the brain, but it's got fatty acids everywhere. Right. But we've been told a story that is scientifically believed as fact, and we will not wander away from that. Yeah. That's that's the kind of craziness. But again, I I say that this concept of fasting in one meal a day, you know, if you have it in the morning or afternoon at night, that's okay. You know, I go and have uh, I love cake and cookies and ice cream, but I have them from time to time. Now, 
I have no problems. I'm not trying to have a baby or mm -hmm. trying to get rid of my bowel bleeding or, or, or migraines or anything. Uh, but if you have a problem, this concept of carnivore and one meal a day is like radical city. Yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the protein, because there's a big trend right now, because I, I don't eat tons of protein and I've gotten a lot of flack for it. I eat enough, but fat is kind of more, fat makes up the majority of my diet. Um, and, but the, the trend right now is to do extremely high protein and take the fat down. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, protein, so people don't understand the digestive system. Fatty acids are taken into the lymphatics and then they're circulated around the body because they don't need processing. Amino acids and sugars must be converted to fatty acids for you to utilize them as energy, okay? Amino acids are used for, for uh, other structures and proteinaceous uh, 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 building blocks of your body. We need very little. Technically, keto is a 80% fat and mm -hmm. maybe 15% uh, protein and 5% uh, 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 glucose or sugars. Again, we make this all up, right? right. And, and it's a label, but I don't measure proteins or I don't measure anything, but I would say proteins, the problem is that they contain, proteins sometimes are not broken down readily into their simple amino acids, that's where you get the, the small microscopic particles that flow into your brain, into your liver, into your kidneys. Remember, every organ is essentially a filter that may lodge all these micro particles that come from the food we eat. So this idea that we need a lot of protein because I'm gonna, I'm gonna pump up and right. build a lot of muscle is just, it's not true. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we like stories. And even when you look at supplements, you know, there are no, and antioxidants, really the scientific stories are really limited on this, mm. but we give our stories. So, you know, I would say if you're eating that one meal, you're probably not overeating protein, but it may be that overeating protein has some adverse effects, especially if you have liver damage, mm. fatty liver disease is caused by a high carbohydrate diet. Yep. And it's as simple as that. Yep, it is. It is. And it's very prevalent these days too. So many people are getting fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, and, and the question is why? Yep, exactly. And the answer is, is so simple because 90% of what we consume is plant-based. Yep. That's it. Yep. People are afraid of meat, but then you get, you know, going back to the protein thing, that's this big trend right now of everyone eating high protein. I still think people are afraid of fat, even though they've decided to do carnivore or head on over to that low carb side, people are still fearing the fat. And then I'm seeing people see their blood glucose be higher, um, you know, not get the same kind of relief that they would if they would just eat more fat. Well, so the reason sugar glucose levels go up on a protein diet is simple. Amino acids in the liver are converted to sugars. Then they're fed into the, into the system that makes fat. But because our system is damaged, either our insulin levels are lower uh, or, or, or uh, the, the, the mechanisms of the liver cells can't convert them to fat fast enough. Uh, we get higher glucose levels that damage, you know, the microvascular system of our, of our body, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's really 98 to 99% of our body is capillaries. Our blood vessels are 99% mm. uh, of our blood vessels are capillaries. And when they get damaged, it damages our organs at the microscopic level. Mm. Yep. I agree. And that's what's not being told to us. And another radical concept, in my opinion, is there's no such thing as insulin resistance. Hmm. It doesn't exist. How do you quantify that? It's simple. If your glucose level is always higher because you're eating glucose producing food all the time, what should your insulin be? 
Should be high, right? right. <laughs> Sky high. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm convincing you to have a lot of lettuce and fruits and vegetables and seeds and nuts three to six times a day, is your glucose level going to be higher? Absolutely. Should your insulin level be higher? Yeah. Always. So as long as you're secreting glucose in your bloodstream, insulin goes up. So what's the most simple cure for diabetes, especially type two? Right. Get off the Carnival sugar. Keto, yeah. one meal a day. Fasting. Oh my God. If you go fasting and your, your glucose levels go lower, your insulin goes lower. Is that like really take a, a rocket scientist? Uh -uh. Right. Exactly. It's simple. But we've been convincing everyone of this story. Glucose is your energy and insulin resistance is your problem. Yep. Oh, you're just unlucky. Yeah. It's your DNA. Our DNA is built to be a land animal and a hunter. Our DNA is not built to be a fish or a grazing animal. When you get back to who you are and what you are, remember 99% of us are identical. Mm. Our DNA and everything about us. When you get back to who and what you are, you're a lioness and a lion, not a pig nor a cow. No disrespect to any other organisms in their choice or anyone. But this is a game changer. I did a TEDx talk called The Human Ferrari. Mm. You understand that we're really Ferraris. We're the most expensive, irreplaceable, and valuable entity to us. But we treat ourselves like a Yugo. And that is not good. We need to change. We need to find faith and spirituality. Eat far less. Again, we're eating too many calories is our problem. Yeah. And, and, and try counting calories. I don't know how to count calories because counting calories, remember your brain, what it sees and thinks it sees has nothing to do with reality because our story is our truth. Mm -hmm. You change your story, you change your truth. And that's the most critical component of this whole amazing, amazing story. If you, if you have faith, in God within all of us, and you begin to look and listen and learn from the practices that slow us all down, be more patient, be more discerning. We're not meant to live uh, at, at, in, in an amusement park. We're right. meant to live in a temple. Variety and spice is not good. I don't add any spices to my diet. Mm -hmm. I, in my babies is bacon, eggs, butter, beef, ice cream, and intermittent feasting and salt. And don't overdo any of those things. If you're gaining too much weight, you're eating too much, period. Yep. Uh, and, and whether it's this much fat or this much fat, I don't know if I know the right answer, but you've got to be the N of one is the experiment. And if you're looking for some major experiment that's going to answer your question, you're going to be waiting a lifetime and you don't have time for that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. It's so simple. Well, this has been really, really wonderful. I know you have a fireside chat that you do. What is that? Like Sunday mornings? Sunday or morning, your... 10 a.m. Most every Sunday morning, uh, Eastern yep. time. Yes. Uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Ah. And I share this. I answer questions. I share stories um, and hoping that more and more people out there like yourself and others, when they find something, they get out there and they share it uh, because um, we're all seeking health and wellness. Uh, life is a fertile grounds and yes. uh, you want to continue to explore that. Um, and if what you're doing isn't working, look around, listen uh, and do something different. Definitely. Wonderful. And people can find you again, Instagram, YouTube. I'll put all that in the show notes um, and your website. Also, you do quite a bit of blog. I mean, you do so much. You do so much blogging and writing and you have so many books and so many things that you put out. It's amazing. I enjoy doing it. If you look at drkilts.com, uh, that has a lot of the resources. Um, CNY Fertility has some of the resources for those who are uh, in the world of uh, fertility and looking to conceive. Uh, a baby. Um, uh, but I just love sharing these ideas because I'm a physician. I went into medicine to help people. 
And if I can help more people in a way that is, you know, not just a traditional, you know, one person at a time, that that's really my, my driving force is to help people find joy and happiness in life. Uh, but it's mostly not to find it, but to see it right where you're at and then do the rest of the work to be more creative in your life. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so oh, much for you. coming and chatting with me today. This has been wonderful. And I know my audience is really going to enjoy it. It's crazy concepts, but unless we dig deep into some opposite approaches, we'll never learn and grow. I agree. I completely agree. And it's definitely contra what's being shared out there. So we got to keep spreading the message a hundred percent. What you, what you um, fertilize and, and, and put your time and energy to will grow for sure. Definitely. That's the most important thing. Don't get 100%. distracted. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.